Uh, can everybody hear me? Yep, you sound great. Okay, great. Um, so uh, today we um, have the Grace Marie Kaler uh, <clears throat> Award presentation and uh, endowed lecture. <clears throat> As many of you know, the Division of Cardiology holds monthly research conferences uh, during the academic year. And at these conferences, the cardiology division faculty and uh, the research-oriented fellows present their research accomplishments and discuss future research directions. The atmosphere is interactive with questions and discussion. The primary goal of the conference is to provide the researchers, the uh, faculty members with a forum for sharing their research results with colleagues and for receiving constructive criticism that helps them improve their research. The Grace Marie Kaler Cardiology Research Endowment Award, which is given today, will be given to one research conference presenter per year whose work is judged by her, his colleagues to be particularly meritorious. And these funds are designated to support the direct costs of the research project presented at the conference. Uh, Francis is the uh, Kaler awardee this year for his presentation last year. I'd just like to say a couple of words about Grace Marie Kaler. Um, I'm reading from an email uh, from her son uh, that was sent back in 2008 when the endowment was made uh, on her passing in her will. Um, she worked her entire professional career at the UW hospital in research and spent her final days as a patient of the hospital. Those attending her created a gentle, warm environment and helped her to pass with dignity and grace. I cannot think of a more wonderful way of remembering my mother, her generous donation and her contributions to research. Uh, <clears throat> so we are very fortunate to be recipients of that endowment. Uh, I'd like to say a few words about Francis, our speaker today. Francis was born in Corvallis, Oregon. Um, he, got a BS in chemistry at UC Berkeley and his MD at UCSF. Uh, he was headed towards anesthesia at UCSF, but fortunately for us decided to uh, take a turn and pursue internal medicine and eventually cardiology here at, uh, at UW. He's been on the cardiology faculty since 1999 and holds the Kenneth Cooper Endowed Professorship in Preventive Cardiology. Uh, and he's, he's held that since 2008. He's a past winner of the Kaler Award. He's actually our first person to win it twice. Um, and he's also the uh, winner of the Fialco Scholar Award given by the Department of Medicine to promising junior faculty. What impresses me most on reviewing um, Francis's CV last night is really the scope of his excellence. He carries out preclinical research, clinical investigation, uh, extensive clinical care, including um, outpatient clinic, Echocardi echocardiography and uh, CCU attending. He's now leading our T32 training grant. Um, <clears throat> his study section service is particularly impressive. He's going on eight years as a chartered member, um, a total of standing NIH study sections. Uh, and he served on multiple ad hoc and special emphasis panels as well. And those of us who have done that sort of work know uh, how much time and effort it requires. Uh, Francis's research focus has been on endothelial function, the nitric oxide system in health and disease, and out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Uh, his publications appear in prestigious journals such as Circulation Research, ATVB, American Journal of Physiology, JAMA, JBC, and Journal of American Heart Association, a really impressive scope of clinical and basic journals. Uh, so Francis is going to talk to us today about endothelial function in cardiovascular disease, one of my favorite topics. Francis, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, David, for the uh, kind introduction. And uh, I thank the uh, Kaler family um, for this honor. So, uh, so I'm gonna talk today about uh, the relationship between um, vascular dysfunction and a lot of diseases that we uh, take care of. I actually got this um, off of a website um, in terms of a, a group that's actually trying to sell uh, measuring endothelial function, but it kind of highlights all the main points I'd like to cover today. The first is the importance of the endothelial cell on the vascular system. 
but its relationship to disease is pretty interesting. Um, a lot of these diseases uh, are vascular. Um, a lot of things that we take care of, such as myocardial infarction, uh, ischemic heart disease, peripheral artery disease. But a lot of the vascular dysfunction is also probably plays a role in the development of certain diseases. And one interest of mine is the role of endothelial dysfunction in the, in the genesis of diabetes. And finally, a lot of these um, vascular dysfunctions are the result of a lot of common risk factors um, that we see in vascular disease, such as smoking, hyperlipidemia, and high blood pressure. So on, on today's um, talk, the outline would be, I'm gonna first cover a little bit about endothelial cell and nitric oxide, some of the basic um, biology. And I'll spend most of the time discussing how endothelial function is actually measured clinically. Uh, third, we'll talk about the clinical implications of some of these measurements. And finally, uh, the cellular mechanisms is one area that I'm very interested in. And there's a lot of different studies in terms of how this, um, uh, how endothelial dysfunction happens. But I'm just going to talk about one particular example in terms of how dietary fats actually cause endothelial dysfunction. So endothelial cells is a mono cell layer that lines every single blood vessel um, in our body. So it goes from the largest vessels such as the aorta, but it also goes down to the capillary level. So this is kind of a cartoon in terms of um, the structure of the blood vessels, including the endothelial cells, vascular smooth muscles, and the adventitia. In terms of the endothelial cell, it's an actually very active organ. And if you took the total cellular mass of the endothelial cells, it actually would represent the largest organ um, in our body. So endothelial cells have been studied mainly in cell culture. Um, and this is how a lot of the signaling was actually done. Um, the middle panel actually shows a cell culture of human aortic endothelial cells. And the panel on the right is uh, human microvascular endothelial cells. They look very similar, um, but a lot of our signaling and our understanding of the basic cell biology have been done in these cell culture models. Now, this is a, a micrograph of a rat aortic uh, mesenteric artery. Um, the white represents staining um, with calcium but this basically shows what uh, endothelial cell pattern looks like in a large conduit vessel. So even though these cells look um, passive, they're very important in terms of vascular homeostasis. So this function of this can lead to abnormal disease and plays a very important role in ischemia and hypertension. If we look at the microvascular endothelial cells, so this is a but a micrograph of a capillary. Um, network in the brain uh, in the rat cortex, you can see in panel C, this is a small capillary, but the endothelial cell lines the entire capillary. But instead of just being a conduit, um, the endothelial cell or these microvascular endothelial cells play an important role in terms of nutrient delivery to surrounding cells, as well as oxygen um, delivery to the cells. So in the capillary level, the endothelial cells play a very important role in nutrient and oxygen regulation to the tissues. This is a photomicrograph of a liver. Um, and in panel D, you can see a cartoon of the endothelial cells. And in these uh, liver sinusoidal endothelial cells, um, they're fenestrated. So they actually allow for a lot of blood and as well as a lot of nutrients to go in between the endothelial cell blood um, cells um, to the actual hepatocytes. So they play an important role in delivering nutrients um, and signaling to the hepatocytes. These fenestrated endothelial cells can also be seen in the glomeruli in the kidney as well. So this also highlights another important aspect of endothelial function. One is the endothelial immune uh, system. So the endothelial cells can actually present uh, antigen to this T cell and they play an important regula regulatory function in CD8 and CD4 regulation. Furthermore, the endothelial cells actually are very important for monocyte attachment as well as macrophage uh, transmigration through the vessel wall into the surrounding tissue. 
So endothelial cells um, play an extremely important role in vascular uh, homeostasis. Um, they're also very important in permeability of the vessel wall. So in diseases such as sepsis and uh, severe infection, this causes a lot of vascular leakage. Um, in angiogenesis and vessel formation, endothelial cells play a critical role. And this is very important for tumor uh, formation. Um, in diabetes, this is very prevalent in diabetic eye disease where there's uh, rapid uh, vessel proliferation in the eye uh, leading to diabetic eye disease. Um, I won't discuss very much about the immune response, but this is a critical area that the endothelial cell plays. Um, and in immunology, it's a very important aspect of um, immune control. And finally, in terms of metabolic control, endothelial cells control uh, flow of metabolites to liver, muscle tissue, and at the capillary level are very important in delivering metabolites um, to the tissues in the distal capillaries. So a simple definition of endothelial dysfunction is that the endothelium doesn't do its regular job to protect the physiologic and uh, protective function of the vessel wall. At a molecular level, this dysfunction is mediated by a, dis, uh, a decreased production or decreased viability of nitric oxide. So what is nitric oxide? So nitric oxide is produced in the endothelial cells by the enzyme endothelial nitric oxide synthase. And once nitric oxide is produced, it signals to the vascular smooth muscle cells uh, through a cyclic GMP dependent pathway, and it causes the vascular smooth muscle cells to relax. So this is a very important for uh, vasorelaxation as well as control of blood pressure. So many of the protective effects of nitric oxide, the one that was first studied is the, is the um, cause for relaxation and vasodilation. So this is important for blood pressure control. Nitric oxide is anti-inflammatory in that the production of nitric oxide by the endothelial cells prevents leukocytes from actually adhering to the endothelial cell uh, monolayer. And this is actually a very critical first step for the development of athero and vascular injury. Nitric oxide also inhibits platelet ag aggregation in the vessel and the vessel wall. So nitric oxide is antithrombotic. And finally, nitric oxide actually suppresses the proliferation of the smooth muscle cells. And this proliferation of smooth muscle cells is also very important in the pathogenesis and the development of atherosclerosis. So how is endothelial function measured clinically? So there are four major areas that um, uh, physiologists as well as clinicians can use to measure endothelial function. I'm going to cover two of these. The first and most important is what we call vascular tone modulation or tissue perfusion. So vascular tone, um, basically we measure what happens to nitric oxide in the large vessels. And in the microvessel, we can examine uh, tissue perfusion um, in, in small capillaries. The second main mean, means that we measure endothelial function is by studying particular uh, biomarkers that we can measure in the blood. In the laboratory and in animal labs, um, we can also measure endothelial function by actually measuring dynamic tissue permeability. And in the lab, you can measure changes in resistance in the blood vessels directly. And finally, an, an area that really hasn't been investigated but plays a critical role is the role of the anticoagulation in the fibrinolysis pathways in the vessel wall. So there are two aspects of uh, measuring large vessel um, endothelial function. One was, is actually considered endothelial dependent. And what do I mean by this is that the endothelial cells are actually critical. So endothelial cells um, with ENOS um, have some kind of activation or agonist and the common ones are just increasing blood flow. And the second most common is by infusing acetylcholine or bradykinin. So these activate ENOS, increase nitric oxide production, and then cause the vascular smooth muscle cells to relax so the vessel actually dilates. The other aspect is something called endothelial independent. 
So in the lab, if I strip off all the endothelial cells, but I give um, the animal or a person a sodium nitroprusside or nitroglycerin, this acts as a nitric oxide donor and then causes the vascular smooth muscle cells to actually relax, and then you get some vasodilation. So the first um, experiments looking at clinical assessment of endothelial, endothelial function were actually done by interventional cardiologists over 40 years ago. And then this, this experiment, they would cannulate the coronary artery, and then they would measure flow using a flow wire, and then they would slowly infuse uh, increasing doses of acetylcholine. So in the coronary artery, in a normal uh, coronary artery, you increase acetylcholine doses, and actually you can see up to a three to fourfold increase in coronary blood flow as a result of the increasing vasodilation. In patients that had coronary artery disease angiography, by angiography, the same infusion of acetylcholine is an impairment, and there's actually decreased or impaired flow in the coronary artery. And in some cases, if the coronary artery is really diseased, you don't get vasodilation, but you end up getting vasoconstriction. And in one of the first studies, when they looked at uh, uh, over two or 300 patients who underwent coronary angiography and had documented coronary disease, they divided patients into uh, responders to acetylcholine. So patients that would actually vasodilate to acetylcholine and other patients would actually vasoconstrict to azo, uh, acetylcholine. And then if you look at event-free survival, so this means being readmitted for chest pain or for recurrent myocardial infarction or stroke or death, the patients that actually had normal or vasodilation did much better in terms of event-free survival than the patients that actually had vasoconstriction. So this was even in the presence of similar degree of uh, atheral burden uh, which they defined by uh, coronary angiography. So this was pretty exciting in the field. So people were interested in not looking at coronary arteries, but looking at peripheral circulation. So they did, they did a lot of these similar studies in brachial artery um, studies where they could measure coronary, I mean, blood flow in the brachial artery system. And a lot of the same results they found in the brachial artery were similar to what they found in the coronary artery. So one non-invasive technique that they can use to measure uh, brachial flow or uh, perfusion in the arm is to use something called venous occlusion plasmatography. So this is a very old technique developed in the early 1900s, but in a sense, you have two blood pressure cuffs that you put on a control arm and an infusion arm, and the blood pressure cuff is uh, uh, put up to about 40 millimeters of mercury to impede venous return back to the heart. But this allows circulation or the brachial flow to remain intact. So this slowly causes um, blood to accumulate in the forearm and this changes the resistance um, of the forearm. And you can actually measure this using a strain gauge. So in order to do an experiment, you'd have a control arm and in the infusion arm, you would cannulate the brachial artery and put in some kind of vasoactive substance, acetylcholine. And in this experiment, they use substance P. You can see that this actually increases uh, blood flow um, in the arm. So using this technique, you could do a lot of the same things you could do for coronary circulation, um, but do it in the uh, forearm. So that's actually an invasive technique. And with the development of a newer technique, um, this method was actually totally non-invasive. So this has actually um, had widespread use in terms of clinical research. So this technique is flow-mediated vasodilation. And then the setup, um, the ultrasound probe is placed over the brachial artery. And this probe can actually measure the diameter of the brachial artery very accurately using edge detection. And then uh, after this is made, measured at baseline, they blow up a blood pressure cup in the forearm, which totally uh, uh, blocks arterial flow. And then after four or five minutes, this blood pressure cuff is released. And then this increases blood flow. And this increase in blood flow can actually increase nitric oxide production and cause the vessel to actually vasodilate. 
So in panel C, um, you can see that the blood uh, diameter is around 2.8 millimeters um, during the blood pressure cuff inflation. When you release it, the uh, diameter increases in response to increasing nitric oxide, but you, actually, you can actually see that the diameter increase is actually very small. It's under 0.5 millimeters of actual vasodilation. If you actually do the same experiment, but infuse nitroglycerin or nitroprusside, you can get a diameter increase um, of over one to 1.5 millimeters. So this endothelial independent um, assessment is actually um, uh, demonstrates a much vigorous increase in uh, vasodilation. So this has actually been studied um, uh, clinically in terms of prognosis. And then this experiment, they took about 300 patients who were being admitted for vascular surgery for peripheral artery disease, and they divided the patients up into people that had good response to flow-mediated vasodilation and people that had low uh, response to flow-mediated vasodilation. And you can clearly see if you just follow these patients over a period of three years, the ones that don't respond very well um, do very poorly in terms of overall survival. Uh, in, this, in this vascular surgery population. The other method that has um, gained increasing popularity is something called peripheral artery tone. Um, the company that makes this actually has a device which they call Endopat. So this actually measures uh, blood flow in the finger. So this actually is not a, a macro vessel assessment, but more of a micro vessel assessment. So in this one, you have a control arm um, and this probe basically measures blood flow. Um, in the experimental arm, we do the cuff occlusion for a period of time. And then after the cuff is released, this increases blood flow in, back into the finger. This increases nitric oxide production and this increases the blood flow, um, which this device can measure. So the height of this is proportional to the amount of uh, endothelial function. Um, in this subject. So in a patient that has endothelial dysfunction post cuff relief, you don't see any evidence that there's an increased blood flow. So this is how they can uh, quantify how much endothelial dysfunction there is. And in one of the first studies um, published um, by Dr. Hamburg in Boston, they took a cohort of nearly 3000 patients in the Framingham cohort and they basically just did the endopat um, in uh, these patients. So this cohort uh, had an average age around 40, uh, 40 years old. Um, they had about a 20 or 15% uh, incidence of uh, hypertension and a 10% incidence of cigarette use. So they just did a population um, level screen to see if this endopat could see differences in different um, groups. So the open circle is basically the control, but in the, op uh, the dark circles are what they um, measured in terms of uh, flow in the finger. And you can see in this study that the women actually had higher levels of flow in the finger compared to the men. And this was also um, seen as people got older that actually had increased uh, PAT ratio. When they looked at certain subjects that had uh, different risk factors, you can see that there was an inverse uh, relationship. So in terms of men and obese men, the PAT ratio actually decreased, which actually indicates that there's more endothelial dysfunction um, in men that are overweight and obese. Um, you can see a similar paddle pattern also in the women. So this is kind of a summary of the two main or three main uh, ways that we can measure endothelial function. So one requires infusion of an a, a endothelial-dependent vasodilator, and I show you some of those um, measurements that it can do in the coronary circulation as well in the periphery. And the other method is to use reactive hyperemia. So um, in this way, we measure flow-mediated vasodilation and the endopod. The main uh, barrier in the, in the coronary circulation whatnot is that they're very invasive um, and uh, they're, they're quite expensive to perform. But if you're gonna screen a large population, it's not realistic to do invasive procedures. 
So most of the uh, attention and effort has been in using uh, flow-mediated dilation and the endopath. So the flow-mediated uh, vasodilation is a very well-established laboratory technique, but it's very operator dependent. So the sonographer that actually um, does these measurements because you're measuring changes of a few tenths of a millimeter um, have to be very well ex experienced and trained to do these measures um, accurately. Furthermore, um, a lot of the uh, environmental factors such as fasting state during the time of the day uh, for women in terms of what, uh, if they're at what period in the menstrual cycle they're in, all affect these measurements. So these are all things that have to be considered uh, when you use flow mediated dilation. Um, Endopat is a lot easier to use. Um, however, in some of the larger studies they use for predictive value, it's not as accurate. Um, it, it's, since it seems to measure uh, microcirculation endothelial function, for some reason, it doesn't seem to correlate as well as with what we find in flow-mediated vasodilation. Now, the other way that um, investigators have used to use measure endothelial markers, um, endothelial function, is to look at very specific markers uh, in the bloodstream. So on the right, um, one of the first ones that were used uh, were to look at soluble um, adhesion molecules, so vascular cell adhesion molecules or intercellular adhesion molecules, which you can measure um, simply um, using ELISA kits. Other factors that people have used uh, is to measure von Willebrand's factor um, and another um, inflammatory marker called E-selectin. So clinical studies have demonstrated an association that elevated levels are associated with peripheral artery disease, diabetes, and also congestive heart failure. One of the criticisms of these studies is that uh, VCAM or ICAM or e selector are not specific to endothelial cells, but can be also released by uh, leukocytes. So people have looked um, at other endothelial specific markers. And in this case, they look at very specific um, things called endothelial micro microparticles. And these are actually pretty small microvesicles that come off the endothelial cells that are diseased. And you can measure a lot of these by uh, flow cytometry. And you can also use, uh, measure these um, using some advanced uh, techniques uh, such as nanoparticle tracking. So in some of these clinical studies, uh, people have shown that these markers are elevated in renal disease, sleep is, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, and also, the, also obesity. Another marker is um, the soluble endoglin or CD105. Um, this is something that can be measured by ELISA um, kits. And this elevation um, when endothelial cells um, are diseased and released has been associated with increasing levels and have been associated with hypertension, diabetes, and hypercholesterolemia. A newer marker called endocan um, is also a very specific marker for endothelial inflammation. And this has been studied um, during sepsis. And um, these uh, markers are actually elevated um, during uh, infectious uh, causes for and changes in the endothelial cell. And finally, um, you can look at in, uh, endothelial progenitor cells. Um, this is kind of an older study from 2005, where they took about 519 patients who were cathed um, and had severe coronary artery disease. And they, marked, uh, they measured these endo endothelial progenitor cell markers, so CD434 and KD positive cells. And they simply grouped these patients um, into high level and lower level. So the idea is that if the endothelium is healthy, they will release a certain amount of endothelial progenitor cells. However, in the uh, sick endothelial cells, the amount of these progenitor cells is a lot lower. So if they uh, followed these uh, 500 patients um, over the course uh, about a year, you can see that the ones that had low levels of these progenitor cells um, did poorly in terms of event-free survival. And by event-free survival, I mean readmission for chest pain, uh, recurrent MI, 
or sudden death. So this marker is very good in terms of prognosticating what happens to these patients um, uh, over the course of uh, their disease. So what are the clinical implications of actually measuring endothelial function? So I'll cover four areas. Um, one is, is endothelial function a marker for cardiovascular risk? Uh, the second, does actually uh, endothelial function have any value in asymptomatic patients? And third, um, is there a role for endothelial function measurements in actually prognosticating what patients with uh, cardiovascular disease have? And then finally, does endothelial dysfunction identify responders and non-responders to the uh, therapy? So the answer to the first question is an overwhelming yes, because abnormal endothelial function in numerous clinical trials is really associated with a lot of the risk factors uh, for, for uh, vascular disease. So abnormal endothelial function has been um, uh, demonstrated in patients with hypertension. Even a family history of hypertension, these patients have um, abnormal endothelial function. So the traditional factors such as aging, diabetes, obesity, uh, even uh, hyperhomocysteinemia, and interestingly, even diseases that have inflammatory components such as periodontal disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus, which are all associated with increased coronary vascular risk, risk have also been associated with decreased endothelial function. Furthermore, the degree of endothelial dysfunction seems to correlate with a number of risk factors. So the more risk factors you have, such as smoking, blood pressure, age, this makes endothelial dysfunction worse. So what about asymptomatic patients? And this is actually a very difficult area um, to investigate. And the answer is maybe um, or maybe not. And it really depends on the patient population, uh, the patient population of the asymptomatic people that you're actually studying. This is actually a study from the uh, cardiovascular health study, uh, which enrolled patients that were elderly. So they were 72 when they um, were entered. And then this subgroup, they actually measured uh, flow-mediated vasodilation, and they separated them into people that had pretty robust uh, vasodilation and patients that had very poor vasodilation. So this is basically uh, just percent survival or over a period of five years. But even if you corrected for all the traditional cardiovascular risk factors, patients that had uh, worse or poor flow-mediated vasodilation did a lot worse than the patients, elderly patients um, that had better or uh, normal flow vasodilation. So in terms of how it ranked in terms of the other cardiovascular risk factors, um, statin use is associated with reduced uh, uh, risk for dying. And actually the higher uh, flow mediated vasodilation you had, this actually lowered the risk um, of having uh, death. So this has been studied in several other large populations and the actual um, data is actually mixed. So if you looked at a more ethnically diverse population in the MESA where they studied 3,000 patients, reduced FMD really predict future events. And this is even after you adjusted um, for traditional cardiac risk factors. However, if you studied a, a younger population in this, this FATE study where they uh, studied young and middle-aged firefighters, um, this study showed no difference in terms of predicting future cardiovascular events. And uh, when people actually looked at this and compared it to the traditional framing head risk scores, the patients enrolled in this had a pretty low um, risk score. It was around 7%. So in this kind of asymptomatic younger population, it probably won't be that beneficial. The last time this um, recommendation or the use of brachial peripheral flow-mediated dilation uh, was used as a, uh, in an asymptomatic population was examined by the AHA and ACC back in 2010. It actually was given a class three um, uh, grading. So there was no benefit in using this. So basically um, a lot of the newer data was not included 
And I think with the advent of um, some larger populations that have been studied, um, FMD may become uh, more useful in certain patient population, but these data really need to be um, re-examined in total. What about endothelial function for as a prognostic value for people with known vascular disease? I showed you some of the data um, when we went through um, acetylcholine response and FMD, but this clearly shows that if you have reduced vascular function, it's very, very good at predicting future events in patients with coronary artery disease. Um, this has been studied in acute uh, coronary syndrome and ischemic cardiomyopathy. So what about the use for endothelial function in, in, in um, identifying responders and non-responders to therapy? So this is um, one of the first studies um, which used um, lovastatin and placebo. Um, this is a group by Wade and Alexander at Emory. And in a subgroup of 40 patients who received lovastatin and 40 uh, patients that received placebo, um, at a two-month follow-up um, after lovastat and placebo, they measured acetylcholine response um, in the coronary artery. So in the placebo group, you can actually see that these patients actually had a vasoconstrictive response, but the patients after two months um, of lovastatin had really not a change, but there was a clear difference between the placebo group and lovastatin. So this was one of the first studies that actually identified that a known intervention that improved coronary vascular outcomes would actually also improve endothelial function. And this study was actually followed up by several other studies which used um, hypertension patients. And they demonstrated that ACE inhibitors, ARBs, coronary vascular uh, uh, calcium channel blockers, which also improve hypertension, are also associated with improvements um, in vascular function. So some of the other traditional interventions, non-pharmacological, such as weight loss and even exercise have been actually shown to improve endothelial function if you make this measurement. So in this panel, um, they, met, they took um, uh, young Chinese adults um, who were uh, basically overweight and had risk factors uh, for developing uh, vascular disease and they put them onto a rigorous program of aerobic and, and weight training. And you can see that after six weeks of exercise training, um, there was a, a, a small improvement in endothelial function, which was uh, statistically significant. But the sad news is that if they stopped training after six weeks and went back to their sedentary ways, the endothelial function kind of went back down. So only if you had, uh, a continuous training, do you still maintain this benefit of exercise? Uh, Flow-mediated vasodilation has been used to study the effect of different foods. Um, uh, one interesting study that actually looked at dark chocolate, um, which has been um, hypothesized to improve endothelial function, they actually showed that uh, a, a consumption of dark chocolate actually improved endothelial function. Um, other studies um, looked at smoking cessation, um, which also have been demonstrated to improve endothelial function as well as cardiovascular endpoints. There's been a lot of interest in studying um, antioxidants such as vitamin C and vitamin E. These have also, also been shown to improve uh, endothelial function, but in large studies, they actually have not been shown to improve um, hard cardiovascular endpoints. And the final um, uh, comment I'd like to make about um, the use of flow-mediated vasodilation is that this could be a very important endpoint for interventions um, that we think might improve um, cardiovascular health. For instance, there's been a lot of interest in the effect of long-term sitting, you know, so office workers that have a lot of sedentary um, habits, what happens to their endothelial function. So people have studied a prolonged sitting can actually reduce endothelial function. And then if you make an intervention where people actually use standing desks, you can actually show some improvement um, in their endothelial function if you intervene by having the office workers actually stand for a couple hours during the day. 
So I think this, this technique is actually very important uh, in terms of evaluating uh, not so much pharmacological interventions, but these lifestyle interventions um, on the effect of vascular health and, and can serve as an intermediate kind of endpoint uh, for intervention studies. So the last part of the talk, um, I'm just gonna talk briefly about one cellular mechanism of how um, uh, dietary fats can actually cause endothelial dysfunction. Um, this is a very old study, um, but I, which I found uh, very interesting, where they took um, 20 uh, college age students and half of them got a 900 calorie diet, uh, mainly of carbohydrates and fruits and vegetables for lunch. And then this is the top group here. But the other half of the group um, ate a lunch of 900 calories, which consisted of a cheeseburger, French fries, and a milkshake. So you can see that this acute exposure to this high fat diet within two to three hours had a significant decrease in endothelial function, which slowly improved after six hours. Similarly, if you can look at long-term exposure to these diff different dietary fats, so in this experiment, they gave um, patients a diet high in PUFA, monounsaturated fat, carbohydrates, and saturated fat. So this intervention study, the saturated fat um, group actually received 50 grams of regular butter. Then they basically measured flow-mediated vasodilation after three weeks in the diet. And you can clearly see that the saturated fat diet cause a decrease, significant decrease in flow-mediated vasodilation. So both a short-term and chronic exposure to a diet high in saturated fat causes a significant decrease in vascular function. So we were interested in trying to figure out what the mechanism by which saturated fats can cause endothelial dysfunction. So these are endothelial cells grown in culture we can stimulate um, these endothelial cells with insulin, and you can actually measure nitric oxide production with a, a specific fluorescent dye called DAF2A. So if you do the same experiment, but pre-treat with a saturated fat, so in this case, it was palmitate and then stimulate for um, nitric oxide production, you can see that uh, just a short exposure of palmitate before insulin significantly reduces nitric oxide production. So we hypothesize that palmitate or any uh, saturated fat would actually activate the NF-kappa B system um, in the endothelial cells. And then this would inhibit the nitric oxide production signaling cascade and ultimately reducing nitric oxide production. So in order to test this hypothesis, we used an inhibitor of IKK beta. So the common drug aspirin actually is a very potent inhibitor of this um, enzyme. And we also did a genetic approach where we used a mute form of IKK beta. So uh, we first showed that IKK beta actually inhibits aspirin. So free fatty acids or palmitate increases IKK beta as expected. But if you pre-treat with aspirin, um, this increase in IKK beta is inhibited. So in terms of reading out for nitric oxide production, the pre-treatment of aspirin um, before you add the palmitate kind of restores nitric oxide uh, production. So in the genetic model, also if we trans transduct the endothelial cells with IKK beta, uh, a mutant form, by blocking the signaling, you can restore nitric oxide production. So these data really suggest that the IKK beta and F-kappa B pathway is necessary um, for free fatty acid mediated um, endothelial dysfunction. So how would this all be put together um, in terms of, of what we see in the endothelial cells? So I've been very interested in how free fatty acids, glucose or excess glucose or advanced glycation end products actually reduce nitric oxide production. And we think that this is actually mediated by NF-kappa B and IKK-beta. 
that this initial step of reducing nitric oxide actually also sets a table for the endothelial cells to release more inflammatory cytokines. And this actually increases uh, reactive oxygen species formation by the endothelial cells. And this uh, further reduces nitric oxide production. And then this actually leads to vascular damage. So this initial insult of free fatty acid glucose actually sets off a vicious circle where nitric oxide production gets further and further reduced. So finally, uh, after, after there's vascular damage, the endothelial cells lose their integrity and they get released into circulation. So why would we actually evolve um, to have this kind of response? And the answer is, is that um, it's well known um, that in the vascular wall, if there's an infection um, by bacteria or viruses, this initial infection into the endothelial cell actually releases inflammatory cytokines. And then this marshals the uh, inflammatory uh, system to come to this area in the blood vessel um, that experienced this damage. So this is kind of another example um, how our kind of our own host defense system um, has been hijacked by um, our Western lifestyle. And this leads to um, low-grade inflammation. So it's not so a matter of, of um, you know, we're more susceptible, it's that our Western diet and Western lifestyle really kind of overlays and activates the inflammatory response uh, inappropriately. So to conclude, um, what I hope um, after this um, hour is to come away with a, the idea that the endothelial cells are really not um, just a passive conduit uh, in the blood vessel, but they really have an important physiologic role um, in terms of immune modulation, also in terms of uh, nutrient um, flow into the capillary and and also in terms of vascular homeostasis. Uh, endothelial protective function is really mediated uh, by ENOS and nitric oxide production. On the clinical arena, um, it's important to realize that endothelial dysfunction really underlies uh, many of our cardiovascular risk factors. So you can actually think of um, the endothelial function or dysfunction as a barometer of how the vascular system is in terms of how healthy it actually is. So all these risk factors that, that we all know about can cause endothelial dysfunction, and you can actually assess this um, by measuring um, endothelial function in our patients. In terms of clinical measures of endothelial dysfunction and their prognostic value, in an asymptomatic population, Yes, it may have some benefit, but it really depends on the asymptomatic population group um, that you want to study. In known coronary artery disease, it's very powerful in terms of prognosticating whether you use endothelial cell markers or flow-mediated dilation in trying to separate patients that will do worse um, uh, with a similar amount of coronary artery disease. And then in terms of clinical investigation, I think um, assessing endothelial dysfunction and assessing the impact of the intervention is really um, a, a strength of, of, of measuring the endothelial function. Because when you're design, designing intervention studies, it's often difficult to follow hard uh, cardiovascular endpoints, um, such as recurrence of chest pain or uh, readmission to the hospital. But if you could have an endpoint uh, which correlates to a lot of these, such as endothelial function, I think it becomes easier to assess um, the effectiveness of a lot of these interventions. So finally, um, I'd like to uh, end uh, by acknowledging um, the Kaler family um, for providing um, uh, support for this award. But I'd like to answer one question that people always ask me is why did, why, would, why did I become interested in endothelial function and dysfunction? And when I was a cardiology fellow here at the University of Washington, when I was trying to pick a research project, I knew I wanted to work um, in a basic science lab. So at that time I approached uh, Brad Burke um, 
who actually had a very large lab and had 16 uh, postdocs and fellows in his lab, but he was very hesitant about uh, taking a cardiology fellow myself because I had no experience in basic science. Um, but after several discussions, um, he was very generous and then offered me a spot in his lab. And he paired me with uh, Marshall Corson, who uh, at that time when I was an assistant professor, but his area of uh, interest was ENOS uh, phosphorylation and regulation, and also the re uh, uh, relationship between ENOS and diabetes. So he introduced me to this subject, and to this day, I'm still uh, studying this subject. And um, I've been uh, very fortunate um, that these two individuals actually gave me the opportunity um, to start down this uh, path and um, started uh, my interest in this area of investigation. So I'll end there and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions or any comments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Francis. So uh, it's a, a really inspiring talk. Um, right off the bat, we have uh, a question from Rob. Uh, Rob, are you uh, able to say this uh, live? Otherwise, I can read it. I don't hear you, so <laughs> I will go ahead. Clinical endothelial dysfunction is always lumped together as one entity. Does the fact that there are responders and non-responders to therapy suggest that there are different types of endothelial dysfunction? Is there data to support this? And what does this mean for therapies? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, so currently, we, I only really discussed uh, flow-mediated vasodilation and, and large vessel um, uh, measurements. And there isn't much data on the other things, such as uh, permeability and um, relationship to anticoagulation. So I think uh, you are on the right track in terms of explaining why there's some non-responders. Um, I, I think that's, that's an area that, that needs to be investigated, but in terms of the tools we have right now to measure, um, these are the things that, that we actually have, and that's where the clinical data is. David Linker asks, uh, do other antiplatelet agents than aspirin, such as clopidogrel, also affect endothelial function? Um, so uh, clopidogrel, in terms of its um, uh, receptor, really doesn't have an effect on the NF-kappa-B pathway. So it doesn't really have that um, anti-inflammatory effect um, on, on ENOS. Um, in terms of whether it actually affects um, uh, nitric oxide dependent platelet function, I think uh, cell signaling wise, I don't think it has that uh, effect because it has a different receptor system that clopidogrel will affect. I've got a, a comment and then a question. I just, in, in um, going over uh, Francis's background and hearing him reflect on it, uh, <clears throat> Resilience is a buzzword uh, these days. And uh, I, I recall when Francis put his KO8 together and one of his uh, 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 faculty members who was going to play a key role uh, announced that he was not only leaving the university but leaving the country, <laughs> Rudy Ebersold. Uh, and, uh, and, and Francis's research plans were really, um, um, uh, cast in doubt at that point. But as you see, uh, he, he was able to, to show resilience, uh, remain committed, productive, and uh, advance his, his, his career as, as you heard before. So uh, it, one really needs to admire Francis for that. My, my question involves the um, clinical use uh, of, of these tests. Uh, yeah, you know, I remember back 20 years ago or so with uh, you know John Dean Field's work and Wayne Alexander's work that you that you cited that there was uh, just a, a, a tremendous uh, swell of enthusiasm that these measurement of endothelial function would be clinically useful, but it, it really has faded away um, and and uh, is is not used much any, anymore. So um, 
what is the key to its uh, resurrection as a clinical tool? Well, I, th I think um, the two me measurements that I talked about, the flow-mediated vasodilation and endopath, FMD um, is actually used in a lot of clinical research at very specialized centers. And these centers, the main thing is that they have sonographers and people that are really dedicated to this technique because the measurements are very difficult to measure and they're, they're small changes. So to get very rigorous um, data, you have to have um, this faci these facilities. The other thing is, is I think the endopat, um, which measures microvascular dysfunction, was really hoped to have a clinical impact. But when you really look at the data uh, from endopat, it only seems to really correlate with uh, metabolic changes. So in predictive uh, effects for people with metabolic disease, such as diabetes or obesity, where there's probably changes in the capillary, you can see bigger differences. But for larger vessel diseases, such as um, athro or for cigarette smoking or these other things that affect the large vessels, you really don't see any changes um, in the endopat measurements. And which was kind of a, a, a disappointment, um, I think, to the endopat people because they were, the ease of this instrument was really hoped to, be, to gain widespread um, usage. Um, that being said, um, there are certain um, academic centers that do offer uh, endothelial health evaluations. So people that have specialized uh, flow-mediated vasodilation can do these measurements accurately, and they actually offer these services to clinical patients. Um, but there, there are a few centers that actually do that. But I think the difficulty of actually measuring um, these things um, has really kind of impeded its, its widespread use. Thanks. Uh, question from Young Kwan. Uh, actually, two questions. Um, the uh, um, uh, first, is there any organ or tissue specific property to endothelial physiology, nitric oxide response, et cetera, coronary versus cerebral vasculature, peripheral circulation? That's the first question. Organ or tissue specificity of endothelial physiology. No, I think if I understand the question correctly, um, I, you're, you're getting a general assessment of the vasculature or, or a large blood vessel, you know, whether it's a brachial artery or femoral artery or whatnot. And I don't think it really correlates specifically to whether it's brain circulation or liver or spleen. Um, you can't really tease, tease that out. Okay, the second question is, is there any relationship between endothelial function and arterial stiffness, such as strain or dis distensibility? Yes, that, um, I didn't cover that. Um, one other clinical measure that people use, um, arterial stiffness, um, you can measure the, the, the velocity of blood flow um, where they commonly measure at the top of the aorta and down to the femoral artery. But in, as our artery, artery becomes stiffer, um, you can measure the change in velocity and then um, uh, assess the stiffness. And the stiffer the artery, the worse, the, the worse um, endothelial function. So arterial stiffness is another measure, but again, um, these measures actually require a pretty um, well-trained sonographer uh, to make these measurements. Well, we're at 8.30, so I'd like to uh, thank Francis and congratulate him again on being our initial uh, repeat winner of the Kaler Award. Uh, th and thanks, everybody, for attending and for your questions. Uh, have a wonderful day and weekend. Bye-bye.